Welcome to another session on the podcast. I'm joined today by Charles Kinsley. He's a freelance journalist, a fantastic writer, and a culture critic. Welcome to the show, Charles. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, same here. You know, it just dawned on me that we've not really met in real life, even though we've known each other for going to 10 years now. Is yeah, yeah, almost a decade. <laughs> Interesting. Almost a decade. <laughs> Interesting. Don't you yeah. see how fascinating the internet is? The ability to connect people, yeah. you know, it's it's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I I, I mean, I mean, I, could, I I should. I yes, the internet is just. I don't think there's any there's been any other innovation that's captured public imagination uh, as much as the internet. Okay, except AI now, artificial intelligence now. Uh, I mean, I mean, we see how that could, um, of course, that could change our lives in, you know, really, really significant ways in the future. You know, of course, we know how deep fakes are coming to, you know, alter people's uh, uh, spread misinformation now, and of course, we could see how, uh, of course, it will have tremendous impact also in education, and music, and other facets of life, basically. So. We don't know how, we don't know what direction it will go in. We don't know what direction it will go in, of course, but uh, we do know that AI is going to really uh, revolutionize our lives. Definitely. You know, speaking of education, I wish <laughs> ChatGPT was around when I was in school. Uh, don't you wish that? <laughs> <laughs> I swear. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> I, I could imagine what Chad GPT, of course, would be doing to this day uh, for, for open up students then back then in school also. But again, too, even in our music school space, I believe that, of course, I, I had the, the producer, I think there was one producer I saw one time in the news, a producer who used AI to, you know, uh, to produce his music. So I believe that more and more artists will be, you know, leveraging AI tools to, you know, yeah, maybe not the mainstream artists, but probably all these people who are more innovative. Artists who are more innovative would, you know, use uh, AI as a tool, you know, in their music production. Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard it to come back. I heard about the producer as well. Yeah, it's it's just amazing how um how far reaching this can be adopted into our professions into our everyday lives and everything and like you said we don't know how this would really impact us now i mean this is just the, like the first or second iteration of ai and already it has disrupted the whole industry so i mean i guess we just have to wait and see the direction this is going to take us exactly 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 but i mean i would love to see what uh, i would love to see how we could leverage ai in our afrobeat sector i mean what ai could do for us yeah yeah in, speaking in of that also speaking of that did you see this ai drake song I'm ai sure you... drake song yeah yeah, yeah. I, i'm not sure I saw, i'm not sure i saw that i'm not sure yeah. i saw that it's created a wave that was like a couple of months ago someone did an ai um no, is it is it Drake or the weekend? And I, I think I'm confused. I think it's Drake. Yeah, it's Drake. It's Drake. Yeah. Someone um did an AI version of a Drake song. And bro, you could you couldn't tell the difference between the real Drake and the AI Drake, you know? <laughs> now <laughs> exactly. People are suggesting that they could use AI to reincarnate dead artists. So you just imagine yeah. you hearing um yeah. a, a Tupac song in an AI format yeah. or Michael Jackson AI song or something. You know, so you could use AI to reincarnate these legends or dead artists. Who knows? I think, I think, I think, I think that happened in one country. Like I read a report one time on a this media out the rest of the world. It happened in a country, I don't know whether it's India, but one of those Asian countries and the family were the family were really displeased with that, with what fans were doing, using AI to, you know, reincarnate um the late musicians music and discography and the family were really displeased i think they had to take some legal actions or something but yeah i think that's actually happening already yeah and, and it, yeah they will take some legal actions but the moment it is out there it is already out there there's nothing you can do about it you know the worst <laughs> they could the worst they could do is just take it down from streaming platforms or what have you but it's already out there you know yeah, exactly exactly, yeah. exactly. It, it's just fascinating though it's fascinating it's it's it is it's far really really fascinating. I mean, it's a 
wonderful time to live in in this world. I mean, it's a really interesting time. I yeah. Would say. What a time to be alive, man. I say, what well, exactly? <laughs> So I wanted us to start with uh, adulting. I know it's, it has nothing to do with Afrobeats, but the thing okay. is, both, both of us celebrated our birthdays last month. So... Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Related our birthday to you, I didn't even know about you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like posting about it. But, but the point is, yeah. I, I wanted to get your thoughts on growing up. You know, how did it feel like growing up a little now? How did it feel like? Oh, man, you know, at first it comes with a, you know, it's a bit, what I say, it's, um, it's sort of, um, it's not really, it's, it's not an easy process, definitely. I if you remember what I told you then, that um, one, I think one of the first conditions of adulting is compromise, you know, you come to find out that um, things will never go the same the way you planned them, you come to find out you would never probably study the course you were, had planned, you would never become, you would never succeed in that career you had hoped to, you know, you had dreamt about as a child. And so you had come to compromise on your ideals, you know, you realize that to get, you know, to succeed in the world, you have to be um, more cooperative, you have to tolerate some kind of people, you have to tolerate some some nasty shit just to, you know, to get headway in the world today. So it's a really, um, it's tough, a lot of people, it's tough, especially here yeah, growing up in Nigeria, it's, 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 it's of it's dwelling, but um, coming to terms with that reality that, you know, coming to terms with that reality, the need to compromise is just makes it, you know, probably I would say makes it easy to, not like makes it life easy basically, but it's easy to deal with the reality is more. Oh, that's an interesting <laughs> perspective. It yeah. reminds me of, um, I don't know whether you know this guy, Michael Douglas is a British writer. So I was watching one of his interviews the other day and he said one of the lessons he got from one of his mentors, that's Christopher Hitchens, was that mm -hmm. in life, you get to choose your regrets. And I think that speaks to your point about compromises. Sorry, you know? sorry I, didn't get that. I didn't get that, I'm sorry. So he said Christopher Hitchens told him that in life, you get yeah. to choose your regrets. Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So, and I think that goes to your point about having to make compromises. The exactly. truth is, I don't think you can really have it all. I don't think yeah. anyone can have it all. You definitely have to make yeah. some compromises. You know, I think yeah. in, in economics, it's called opportunity cost, right? Exactly, so what are you yeah. willing to forgo to attain a higher purpose? Whatever the higher yeah. purpose is to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, let me say that. Our generation is very scared of growing up. You know, I don't know whether it's it's unique to us though, but anecdotally, from the posts I've seen on the internet, from the conversation I've had with friends, people complain about growing up, that this wasn't the life mm -hmm. we were promised. You understand? Yeah. And the thing is, when we're young, we desperately wanted to grow up. We thought growing up comes with freedom, the, the freedom to do whatever it is you want to do. But exactly. only for us to realize that growing up actually is a life of responsibility, responsibility to your romantic partners, responsibility to your parents, your siblings, to society in form of you paying tax to society. So is it really worth it? I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> I think this, this I mean, uh, what you just said reminds me of an article by The Economist. And, you know, I'd say them Gen Z, you know, Gen Z have um, big, big face, expensive face, but thin wallets. I think I saw something like that also. No. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and that's yeah. So, so we, they have expensive face, but thin wallets. And uh, if there's anything, I mean, if Gen Z had, if we ever had the chance to run away from responsibility, I swear we'd all we'd all run away from responsibility. But I think Absolutely. I think what I actually fueled this this um um this fear in a way, what has fueled this fear has been the internet, technology, you know, the rapid pace of technology that makes it seem like we could do anything, we could get anything just with the flick of a finger. And so we expect that um, the natural course of things should also proceed with this very fast way. We we're quite an impatient, you know, quite an impatient lot. And so we we tend to expect a lot of things to go very very smoothly no itches uh, along the way and all that and that comes with um, so many disappointments when you find out when things do not go like that um, nature nature has its own course 
uh, uh, will be different from technology. So I think it's the time we bring in, you know, how we, well, unlike, I mean, we probably will bring in, in the Stone Age or uh, in 20th century, 19th century, and all of that, uh, we would be better. How would I could be better fit to cope with some of these challenges? So maybe some of that, I, if you look at a lot of these people who write self-help books, recommend hitting the gym, going to the gym, doing some hard work just to instill in you a sense of that responsibility, taking cold showers and all of that stuff. So they feel like, I mean, we are too soft. Uh, technology makes things too easy in our lives. So we should try to shake up our shake up this, you know, this cocoon by taking some very hard decisions, cold showers hitting the gym, um, staying away from your phone, disappearing for a while, I know all of those things like that, like that, like that. So imagine if you said those things to a couple at the at Gen Z now, they'd look like, oh no, where are you from? They start look at you with a sense of wonder, like, I mean, are you okay? <laughs> so I couldn't agree yeah. more with you. I couldn't agree more with you. All right, so let's get into today's business. Today, we want to talk about Afrobeats and pop culture in Nigeria. Now, I want us to start with the age-long Afrobeats versus Afrobeats debate. Now, I've heard a lot of music critics and music purists make the case that the term Afrobeats with the S is a misnomer. Do you agree with that? Uh... <laughs> I don't quite agree with that. I don't quite agree with that. Um, you know, we should first look at, perhaps we'll just trace the genealogy of Afrobeats, um, yeah, which uh, of course could be traced to Fela Kuti and uh, Tunyale and his drummer then yeah, in the 1950s or 1950s, 1960s, I would say. So, and then and Afrobeats, if you look at it in a way, Afrobeats draws, of course, draws from um, West African juju, American funk, and um, uh, West African juju, American funk, uh, a bit of soul too. Um, so at the core of Afrobeats, we have this orchestra-like bands and, um, and politics, of course, is central to Afrobeats, you know? So it was a means of a medium to drive our, um, a medium of protests against government and violence, uh, government misrule and all of that. Um, but I see Afrobeats as a hip version of Afrobeats. You know, I mean, of course, we of course we'd say Afrobeats started probably in the 2000s. You know, Afrobeats started in the 2000s, and of course, what we call Afrobeats now these days is just basically Afro pop, but just in a way to establish a sense of connection with what you know with. Felakuti, they decide to just give it Afro bits, you know, I would say, you know, just establish a sense of connection with Felakuti. So they would say, they would call it Afro bit. But a lot of what we have here is Afro pop, you know, that appeals to the pop culture, that draws the themes from basically the pop culture and from what's around us, from our everyday lives and all of that. So I would say Afro bits is a hip version of um, Afro bits. Yes, um, Afro bits doesn't, uh, there, of course, there are lots of ways in which they differ. Um, of course, um, politics is not central to our So We talk about love, sex, romance, hustle, cybercrime, and all of that. And um, yeah, Afrobeats also draws from a wild, a wild vista of sounds. You know, unlike Afrobeats, Afrobeats draws from a wild vista of sounds from um, is it um, R and B, hip hop, so I'm on piano. Makosa and all of that jazz like that. So yeah, I would say in a way, I wouldn't say Afrobeat is a misnomer, but I just say it's 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 sort of it's it, I won't even say Afrobeat evolved now, but it's a hip culture. I, I mean I, I understand that um artists in this generation wanted to create something that could, you know, it's a way of creating something that they could find pride in, you know, that appeals to them, appeals to their times, and you know, it's also nationalistic in a way. So Afrobeats is, is that very thing? Well, I happen to pitch my tent with the purist here. Um, <laughs> I just can't really see any major similarities between what we have today with the first iteration of Afrobeats in the days of Fela 
you you did highlight some of those differences. Um, Fela was very anti-government in his music. He was anti-state. Exactly. And Fela was ideologically driven. You know, he was an Africanist and a Pan-Africanist. In fact, yeah. a rabid one, if, if I could make the case, you know. So today's heart is, like you, like you mentioned, they sing about cybercrime, girls, money. And then if they want to appeal to the sensibilities of uh, poor folks, they pray to God to get them out of the trenches and things like that. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, a friend of mine coined a term. He called it um, Afro Adura. Which I think is very is very <laughs> which I think is very, very uh fitting is a fitting description of that, should I say subgenre of, of Afrobeats, you know. So I honestly don't see the difference between a Davido or Fela. I, I can't I just can't see the difference. It's a wide, there's a wide gulf between them. Yeah, yeah. And also you mentioned the orchestral um nature of Fela's Afrobeats, which is I think the most the biggest difference between uh, the earliest iteration of Afrobeats with what we have today. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't know how you feel when contemporary Afrobeats artists try to perform with bands. Do you do, do you enjoy it? Personally, I don't <laughs> enjoy it. I, I don't enjoy it, <laughs> personally. <laughs> okay. I, 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 well, I don't, the thing is, yeah, um, with bands, well, I I'm, I'm, uh, I I do like uh, I like bands unlike you anyway I love live bands I I love not just singers coming to lip sync to their track on stage no you know I love to see live uh, live performance of a particular song and all that you know uh, it's it, I love to see the um, singer lost in the rhythm and all that all of that stuff sure but yeah but going back to your earlier point about the disparity between Afrobeats and Afrobeats yeah there's actually a world of difference between these two and it's quite I think it's just there was a time I, I'm sure it's, it's actually reduced now but there was a time when every artist always saw Fela as a model they were always uh, you know uh, I came back to Fela as a model it was Whiskey, David O, Burner Boy, like Omo. Um, and the, even when there was just nothing, there was no iota of similarity between the music they made and Fela's music. There was no iota of similarity between their lifestyle and Fela's lifestyle, you know? So as I said earlier, I just feel like Afrobeats was just a means for new generational artists to establish a connection with that, with the original roots of Afrobeats. That's just what I say, basically. Yeah, so maybe it's not, that's why I say, call it, I, I think it's the hip version, like, I mean, a modded version of whatever. And uh, maybe we can understand why Fela's um, offsprings have, have stuck so stubbornly to practicing just Afrobeats, you know, you know, to practice that very same line of music that as their father. But there's a, there's a problem with that, actually, because, you know, when you have to still do what your father, you, 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 it means that you're living under your father's shadow you know, and as such, your father's shadow will continue to grow over years and can establish your own fame and glory. You know? So we speak more about Fela than about um, family and Shem. Yeah, you have you a know, point there. The you have a point there. And I would even say that both of them cannot do what Fela did. To be honest, I, I listen to Shem sometimes or I listen to Femi and I still don't get the feeling I get when I listen to Fela, you know. Of course, to to their credit, they've they've tried to stick to that um to that style, but it's it's not original. This the way Fela did it. It's just an original. Exactly. So I would say yeah. that I would say Afrobeats perhaps died with Fela, you know. So, but of <laughs> course, Femi and uh, Sheon. And even Lagbaja, they try to do their own yeah, version of it. But... Lagbaja, exactly. And the unique thing about Lagbaja is Lagbaja um used traditional instruments to play Afrobeat. He, he, yeah. he uh introduced uh what was it called Gonga to to Gunga, his own style yeah. of music. But for, yeah. you know one thing about Fela is this: Fela was as was an African, was a Pan African. Yet he never made use of traditional instruments. And I don't know, that's very very interesting. It was it was. Is stickler when it comes to his his instruments, you know, sax, uh, the keyboard, um, trumpet, and what have you. But he never made use of yeah. any traditional instruments, which I find to be very interesting. Perhaps you could say a cognitive dissonance, if you will, 
on the one hand, you claim to be an, an African is, but when it mattered the most in your music, you never made use of any traditional instruments. Made use of traditional, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I, I really don't. Well, well, now <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I, I can't see to fellas why to know why I did that. But I would say maybe who knows? I, I mean, if you remember, if you when you started music, he wasn't even doing this Afro beats. Absolutely, you know, he was doing. Yeah, understand. I think he was when he had to travel to London. And you met some persons who exposed him to the works of um, African Americans, Malcolm X, James Jackson, and all of those people. And then he now started to perform his Pan African self. And the, I think that was when he renamed his band to African 70 Point, the African Shrine, and then thought about creating something more nationalistic and Pan African. So, but I, I wouldn't, I, I, I can't possibly tell why he, you know, preferred the uh, conventional, like the uh, modern forms of instruments to the traditional. Yeah. It's probably so, yeah. so. so to my point earlier about bands, no, I'm not saying I don't enjoy live bands. Obviously I do. I'm, I I'm, I think I like to think of myself now as a budding jazz enthusiast. You know, I'm still in that, in the head of faces of listening to jazz. So I obviously would like live bands. But the point I'm making is this. There's a bit of a disconnect when you see Afrobeat artists trying to perform with live bands. They just it's it doesn't sound as pleasing to the ears, like say a fella would perform, you know. Okay, it, yeah, it doesn't yeah. sound as pleasing. Just very few of them can actually execute that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, let Bonai Boy does it for all his feelings, for all his arrogance and everything. For Bonai Boy performs excellently with live bands, but yeah. I mean. I don't think whiskey does that. I don't think Davido does that. Perhaps it's my personal bias speaking here, but I they don't they don't do it as excellently as let's say Bonaboy does it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I I I I guess also I think there's a there's a something about Afrobeats that is anthem like, you know, and that's where the orchestra fits in, you know. So there's there's something about Afrobeat that is anthem like, and that's where the orchestra fits in. So to provide the backup. You know the backup sounds for you. Uh, I, I so I, I mean we understand that orchestra is a, is a core part of Afrobeat. So if you remove the orchestra from Afrobeat, you wouldn't get so much Afrobeat like that. It'd just be one person ranting, you know. So that's why the band they are supposed to back you up and provide that accompanying sounds, you know. So but in and in case of Afrobeat, uh, you just have someone not. You don't have that anthem-like quality. It's just you singing about, um, you know, singing to a particular quality, singing to his fantasy, you know. So it's just you in your own self, lost in your fantasy, singing about one lady you've met, one girl you met, thinking about, singing about your your sexual escapades and all that, you know. So it's uh, so I think it's the quality of it's the quality of the music basically. Yeah, Bonaboy does have some parts of sounds. Uh, I, of course, I've seen Bonaboy's orchestra. That is, what are they called? The outsiders. Outsiders, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the outsiders, and yeah, and they are quite a great lot. You know, you need to see them perform. Yeah, awesome, it's awesome, so awesome. All right, Especially. so. Um, speaking about orchestra, that orchestra bent to Afrobeat. I think Ashake tries to do that to the best of his ability. If you listen to most of his his hit songs, there's that choral. Yeah. There's it has that choral element to it, especially yeah. it's, it's, it's a choruses. Anyway, you know, there's this mm. choral element to it, and I think it does that well. It's probably the only one I can think of right now that imputes that to his music. You know. Anyway, so I want to get your thoughts on um, the ever-expanding um, names artists give to their music today. Um, Rema calls his own music Afro, Afro Rave. Um, Bo Fireboy calls his own music Afro Soul. Is it Afro Soul or Afro Live? One of the two. Um, you know, I can't, I can't recall others now. People just choose to give their sounds whatever name they feel like today. <laughs> Now, do you think that is indicative of the di diversity of Afrobeats today, or is just artists trying to be arrogant and just trying to put labels on their on their song? What do you think? Oh, that's quite an interesting part. I really don't think it's uh, for me. I don't really see it as 
a form of diversity as expression of diversity. I just feel it's just artists trying to establish themselves from conformity, you know, from not being built as a general whole and trying to establish a, a mark for themselves in a world that is becoming fiercely competitive, you know, in an industry that is becoming fiercely competitive. So I don't see it as a mark of um, diversity in any sense because if you look at it very well closely, I feel like these people seem invariably the same thing. It's just different, different sounds. And what is Afrobeat all about? Afrobeat, of course, Afrobeat doesn't have a core sound. Afrobeat is a, is a, is a, is a far ranging, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's combines, it draws heavily on several sounds from hip hop. So, so it picks from different genres. So I don't really see this as a diversity of Afrobeats now. I just see people, this is just people just trying to, it's just probably, uh, how would I put it? Uh, just um, people just trying to establish their own, well, Maybe in their own heads, they're trying to, you know, stay away from the crowd, just like Bonaboy would call these Afrofusion, you know. I mean, what is Afrobeat if not a fusion of sounds, please? <laughs> I get your points. I get your points. Um, but do you think um, there's a conscious movement to diversify the Afrobeat sound? Um, I think there was a time alt artists had a good run, I guess, in 2016, 2017, 2018, um, they wanted to diversify Afrobeat. They branded themselves as alt artists. I don't know what's happening to those guys right now. So, but do you think there's this conscious movement to diversify the Afrobeat sound of late? Yeah, yeah, I think, yes. I, I, I think there's a conscious movement to diversify some because right now we're seeing more um, in future, we're seeing people draw sounds from even traditional Yoruba sounds like Akbala, which is your, which I understand that you, you're a great supporter of. Uh, yeah, so you see people draw from Akbala, you see people draw sounds from um, I'm a piano lately as we've seen on recent now. So I think there's a cautious, there's a conscious uh, this thing effort put in place to diversify, to broaden the sounds of Afrobeat. Already too, we saw with these cases, um, OG piano too. You know, uh, trying to you know establish a case for what I say uh, a blend of high life, Igbo high life, and I'm on piano sounds. So yes, it's, it's, of course, this all, all of these efforts are conscious. You can see these efforts towards broadening the sounds, and I really think that that's uh, yeah, sort of like the evolution of Afrobeats. You know you know, keeps incorporating new one, new sounds, so traditional sounds blending traditional sounds and uh, <clears throat> sounds to make it more appealing to listeners. Okay, fair point. Um, what do you think are the factors that led to the explosion of Afrobeat globally? Predominantly in Africa, though. Um, you know, <laughs> growing up in the 90s, early 2000s, getting an international feature was a big deal. It was an absolute yeah. big deal. But today... Yeah. Um, Afrobeat artists casually feature American artists and no one really cares anymore, to be honest. So exactly. what do you think has led to, you know, the incursion of Afrobeat into the American market? Because the truth is this, everyone, whether you're a movie producer, you're an artist or both of you, you want to enter the American market, everyone all over the world, because the moment you make it in America, you've made it all over the world. And yeah. for years, Afrobeat artists tried their best to, you know, make that incursion into the American market. But let's say the past five, six, seven years, they've done that. You know, the whiskey, the Davidos, the Bonner Boys, they've done that. So what do you think led to uh, the explosion of Afrobeat globally? I think um, it, um, it has to be the... Um, well... I'm I'm thinking I, I'm sure there will be a number of factors, but I, I'm thinking that um, American artists uh, or global artists probably saw the um, the rich uh, call they, they saw the rich sounds that that thriving in Afrobeat before because if you look back to e pop time we didn't have so much sounds that we have in Afrobeat now in the era so in the e pop times we only had and that was why we had fewer collaborations in the e pop times just mostly Akon and Recross. 
Okay, but no, I'm sure I'm sure the, the um, American artists are coming to see that the Afrobeat has is a more is a it's a richer sound. It provides a richer tapestry of sounds that they could leverage on, you know, to make their music more appealing and reach out to a global audience. Also, again, we could also talk about Nigeria's population, about which is about two hundred and six, uh, more than um, yeah, more than two hundred million Nigerian. Uh, citizens in the world yeah, who are listening to Afrobeat. So uh, it's also uh, predicted that Nigeria should overtake the US in population size by uh, 2100, you know? So we really, so I, I'm thinking on now that this, this, and also immigration too also has a role to play too. Um, when you have more African immigrants who in the US now listening to, um, um, just in listening to Afrobeat, you can now see it has now been spreading. They've been spreading the gospel of Afrobeat. In fact, they use the word to clubs, to you know, to their friends, and you know. So I think there are a lot of factors responsible for this. Um, first, I, I talk. I talked about huge population size in Nigeria. Yeah? So which means that um, global audience, um, American artists could find a very fertile ground here to market their. Yeah? Uh, own um, music too. Uh, we saw that too in, in the case of Beyonce's um, um, Lion album, King album. The Lion, yeah. Lion King album, exactly. So, so which was according to our own letter to Africa. But of course, because we will see that there was a marketing strategy to that too. You know, a means of penetrating the African market. You know, uh, reaching more and more young listeners. So. Immigration, so as I explained earlier, African immigrants moving to the US and other parts of Europe, um, spreading the gospel, it's helping to, you know, um, broaden this appeal with their sounds, trying to showcase African sounds to foreigners over there. So I think there are a lot of factors responsible for this, basically. Yeah, in addition to that, I think the moment we began to adopt our indigenous sounds, that was when uh, the world began to care about our sounds. Because I could remember growing up in the 90s, to early 2000s, we wanted to sound like American rappers, American yeah. R&B singers, you know? Yeah, exactly. It was really a perversion of, of American hip hop, American pop music. But I don't know, maybe around the mid, mid 2000s, yeah, we began to adopt our indigenous sounds we began to, to rap in indigenous languages. And for some reasons, that caught on and Nigerians began to vibe to their own sound. In fact, I don't think Nigerians care more about American um, artists today. The average, the average millennial, the average Gen Z does hardly knows any American songs today. And that's that was that's different from, from what obtained in the 90s and the 2000s. You know, we we <laughs> loved American artists then, but today I don't think people really people really give a damn about American artists, to be honest. So it was when we began to uh, adopt our indigenous sounds, our indigenous language, we uh, we became known to the world for some strange reason. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Then also, I I've think, uh, yeah. okay, I've heard a couple of theories. People say that the movie Black Panther somehow contributed to the explosion of Afrobeat in the U.S. And I don't really see the link, to be honest. And mm -hmm. some people also say, some people also say the song uh, "One Dance" by Drake featuring Wizkid somehow also led to the acceptance of Afrobeats in the U.S. Now I don't know how true that really is, but people say that. So, anyways, well, 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 maybe yeah. I could I could imagine that yes, um, that also contributed. I mean, we, uh, that also contributed Whiskey's crossover. To whiskey's crossover in the U.S., you know, global crossover. That one dance feature, uh, featuring uh, featuring on Drake's one dance was probably maybe not the catalyst, but was also just a, you know was a stepping stone in the global adoption or global um, adoption of Afrobeat. I would say, but yeah, you made a point basically about um, you know Afrobeat being more nationalistic, you know. Embracing our own culture and um, uh, our own country, cultures and strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I think that was what um, pop rap failed to do. Hip hop, basically, you know, if you want to observe, then rap hip hop was that's this our early, you know, the rap we listen to. I mean, the rap rap was close to early then was Mode Nine and um, Rugged Man was this American flavored rap, you know. So that really didn't appeal that much to you know the Gen Z. 
you know, because we're bringing in, yeah, you're talking about well, maybe vague concepts, you know, rap is actually very beautiful, poetry, emotion, but, you know, but you're talking about concepts that people we couldn't really, um, couldn't really, um, you know, uh, they, they they couldn't really relate to you know because of the because of the sound of because of the sound of the music because you were using this Americana you know and that was what made and, and that's what that and that's what we saw we saw an evolution in hip hop we saw the likes of that green using indigenous rap and Olamide and what we now have as known as um, street pop you know the Zinolensky Ti Blaze um, what's this guy's name again. Um, this Zanku guy, what's the name of this Zanku guy? Uh, Zlatan. Zlatan, yeah. Zlatan, yeah, yeah, Zlatan. So, yeah, so I, I think, I think, so he, Afrobeat was more nationalistic in its outlook compared to the hip hop era. So, we, uh, uh, our artists were more distanced from their audience, you know, they, they, they still parodied that American swag. You know, even though they were rapping about stuff that didn't relate to the everyday man, they were rapping in a language that the everyday man couldn't really relate to, you know. But Afrobeat came to our level, you know. Afrobeat gave us something that we could, um, you know, something that we could actually rely on, a means of escapism from the realities of living in Nigeria. You know, sure. it's felt as if, yeah, sure. they're talking about you, they're talking about uh, your life you know, about the hard times we all going through. So it's, 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 it's I mean, it's, it's, so it's, it's more relational, I'll just say, basically. Speaking of rap, um, rap once had a good run in Nigeria. We've had rap yeah. groups. We've had uh, rappers like Mood Nye, like you mentioned, Need to See, MI, Vector. They had a pretty good run. But I think around the uh, mid-2010s, the culture flipped. Um, people started to listen more to songs than rap. In fact, rappers began to switch. You know, there's something about the Nigerian culture today that it turns rappers to singers. Olamide mostly sings today. Even Zlatan. Have you noticed Zlatan is doing more songs yeah, sure, now than sure, raps? Sure, so, sure, sure. I don't know. Why do you think um, the culture flipped? Why do you think Nigerians don't really care more about rap anymore? Um, I think basically, um, I think over time, cultural um, taste evolves. Uh, each generation has um, has its own uh, culture. I'd say or what its uh, its own culture, what its uh, what its wings on, and all of that. So if you observe, right, rap rap had a good run between the nineteen nineties and early. as time. Oh, as time. As time evolved, actually, um, you know, taste shifted. It didn't really relate to our our condition as Nigerians. It didn't relate to our culture. It wasn't nationalistic. It still had. It was still um, heavy with that American flavor. And so, in the two thousand and tens, um, a new, a, 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 I mean, a new guy came up from nowhere. That was Dark Green, which is gritty lyrical brilliance. Uh, you know, spitting rhymes, uh, you know, it, it, basically using words that appeal to the streets, you know, and we're still lyrical, you know, chief executive of Moita, which was the name of his album then. So, uh, so people could really relate with that, you know, they could relate with the Yoruba, they could relate with this blend of Yoruba and Pidgin, and, and then it was lyrical to listen to. You know, even despite the fact that, despite the fact that I was speaking to him, speaking Yoruba, I could still like, you know, non Yoruba speakers could still, you know, flow with his rap, you know, because there was there was a sense of, uh, he could relate with his audience. And so after then, a new genre, a new genre came up, which is a street pop, as we see today, um, you know, where people talk about their, uh, you know, their authors, you know, basically see music as a means, as a medium of, um, as a diary to, you know, Talk about their horses and other personal parts of their lives. But yeah, as I said earlier, rap and um, taste evolved. So um, as we've seen in our own times now, Afrobeat is now the you know the in thing, and rappers have to also evolve. Basically, evolution you have to also evolve. So some people feel like, oh man, if you stuck as a rapper, they they would die hungry. They wouldn't be able to feed families. They wouldn't be able to make any profits at the end of the year. So and um, people they also have to evolve. Yes. Their styles, they, 
you know, they also found that, oh man, this rap business is it's just, it's just not it, you know, it has seen it, it has seen better days, you know, so up onto the new thing now, street pop, so they found a way to just blend in, you know, rap and, uh, and music and just flow in it, so that's what we see the likes of Olamide and Zlatan, who have shifted from their core, you know, core ideals to, you know, to what is in vogue. But so a couple of rappers have still remained adamant to the, you know, they've still sworn low. I like say people have sworn loyalty to the to the genre, to hip hop. Say, hey man, no matter what happens, no matter the tides, we're still gonna stand by you. We're gonna stand solidly by you, hip hop and all that. And so we see that in the case of MI and Co, you know. I mean, even his own brother, um, you know, I've even left him. But Jesse yeah. 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 No, I, I think Jess yeah. Jess is actually multi-talented i think is he has range i think jesse has more range than mi you know he's a singer he's a producer he's a rapper so i think jesse can afford to sing or whatever i don't see that as he selling out now i don't know about mi do if mi has that that much range as his brother so uh the smart thing for someone like mi is probably to stick to to his craft you know while yeah, yeah. people that have more range can afford to you know, do whatever you know, they want to do. You know, it's 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 crazy. They keep blaming the Nigerian public for saying, "Oh, yeah, they left. They they abandoned um rap, and now they, they you know they don't want to accept the fact that rap is dead, that um rap is old fashioned and all that." But I think with the times that we're living, with what we have, people who have now swung to this, you know, um, people. I I think it's people have swung now to to rhythms more, to hard driving rhythms, not basically those sounds now they want something they can actually dance to uh you know and that's why i said afrobeat offers that form of escapism for absolutely escape, yeah. to escape the daily realities the harsh realities of life of living in nigeria you know something you just bury your head in and forget about uh forget about poverty forget about the crashing naira forget about everything that is afflicting nigeria right now you know absolutely. just bury your head and you know in cool sounds. Yeah. Afrobeat leans more to its rhythm, its melody, than it does yeah. to its lyrics. Because if exactly. you were to analyze most lyrics, they really don't, <laughs> they are very, very watery, to be honest. Yeah. Very, yeah. very watery. But there's something about Afrobeats when it plays, you want to move your body, you know, you want to yeah. vibe to it. So in, in that sense, that's the strength of Afrobeat. Not the lyrics, yeah. but the rhythm, the melody. The rhythm, the yeah. melody, yeah. Like, yeah, that, that's typically, that's its all mark, I would say. I mean, a rap, while rap would have uh, 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 lyrics at the core of its, you know, exactly. at the core of its genre, mm -hmm. but Afrobeat just has melody, rhythm, exactly. Exactly. and all mark. So, yeah. All right, so... I want to get your thoughts on the celebrity hero worship culture, the stands. Now on social media, you often see Whiskey's fans versus Davido's fans or Bonaboy's fans versus Davido's fans. You know, it's very toxic. It's a very toxic place. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Personally, I think it's a symptom of poverty in the country. It's a symptom of joblessness because I don't see anyone who has a serious nine to five job engaging in twitter wars about bonaboy being better than davido and some, sometimes these fans go to the extreme i remember when davido lost his, his son some people you know said foul things against this guy they said um some said he sacrificed the son so like bro this these fans some of them they've lost their, their their sense totally to be honest so what do you think about this celebrity euro worship culture going on on the, on the internet you know um well i'm not i'm not surprised because it's it's not just a thing that's common to afrobeat it, it happens maybe yeah it happens in every other i mean every music uh, culture across the world but yeah uh, perhaps in our own case we are a bit extreme you know with the euro worship and all of that but i think it's just a, it's a more psychological thing um people will always have this need to believe in something you know, people always have this need to believe in something. And so once they find an appeal in something, they, you know, they have this need because we all have a bit of emptiness in us and we find, we we look to, we look out to, that's why we have religion. I mean, we need to believe in something, something higher than us, 
you know, we have religion, we have music, we have every other in higher philosophy and all of that. So for these people, they see celebrity, I mean, that uh, their role models as something, as something to believe in and someone they could go to the ends of the earth for, you know. Um, yeah, it happens that, I mean, religion has also done its own case in creating a cult-like following for many, many, many um, for pastors and um, leaders, religious leaders. And I think um, it's just the equivalent of what we have in religion that we have here in the music industry too. So this fan base is just that cult-like following that we see in the religious circle, you know? Yeah, so people would, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, I think it's the mass, it's the kind of appeal they have on, uh, on this, you know, they tend to feel, I mean, they feel of their minds, their fantasies with images of this, person, this celebrity, you know, so it's it's the effects of the music on them or what have you, you know. I think uh, we, so we, uh, if, if I would go outside, outside, outside Africa, we, have, we saw it in the case of uh, Michael Jackson. I mean, growing up, I watched a lot of videos and I was like, I saw people fainting and I was like, oh my God, these people are so gullible. I mean, how would they be fainting just because of a certain stroke of hand that Michael Jackson just did? But, you know, I think, I mean, on our, on our own side, we've come to see instances of this. And I think it's, it's, just, it's just the typical phenom natural phenomenon of celebrity, you know, whether in whatever face, facets of society is, you always find that cult-like following, you know, yeah. True, true. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, Nigerians don't really have a lot of things to be proud of. Uh, politics is trash. Um, yeah. The only thing they find pride in is the music, and the music has yeah, yeah, uh, been yeah. a success, you know. So yeah. I think that also contributes to the Euro yeah, worship yeah. culture. Yeah, exactly, know. exactly, yeah, so. exactly. And also of this of our, of our campaign, Afrobeat to the world, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, that explains why you know we keep pushing up for that, pushing that campaign on Twitter and other social media channels. Absolutely. Um, I was having the discussion with a friend the other day. Uh, I'm talking, I'm speaking to the Afrobeats to the world, you know, sentiment. Now, have you noticed how in the early 2000s, you know, we used to complain about the Grammys being discriminatory. You know, they discriminate against African artists, they discriminate against African artists. Uh, and now in recent years, we've had Bonaboy, we've had Thames, we've had um, uh, Whiskey Excuse win some Grammys. So, Personally, I think there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance. On the one hand, you claim the organizers of these awards discriminate against you, and yet you still desperately want to win these awards. I don't know why you see this cognitive dissonance. So personally, if I was any of these guys, I wouldn't give a, I wouldn't give a damn about the Grammys, to be honest, as long as I am validated by my own people in my own country and on my own continent, if anyone wants to give me a gram, I was fine. If they don't want to give me any gram, I'm good. Because I cannot say on the one hand, these guys are racist, they're discriminatory. And on the other hand, I still want to win that award. You know? And to be honest, this, this is the way I personally see it. But the Grammys are an American award. It's, it's organized by Americans, right? So what that means is Americans would prioritize their own music, their own artists, more than any other artists across the world. Yeah. You understand? It's just we have Eddie's in Nigeria, right? So imagine an artist from the Gambia or an artist from Botswana complaining that the Eddie's are discriminating against them. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Uh, Naturally, you know, the Eddie's will prioritize Nigerian artists more than any other artist in the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, on that, on, on in that regard, in that regard, I would say this: that. Um, well, yeah, you know, I, I think the, the Grammy the Grammy represents the, the peak of a music uh, a musician's career, and um, for Nigerian artists who are desperate to do that to make a crossover, uh, uh, you know, on American markets, uh, the Grammy represents. Uh, imagine it's like a Grammy is a stamp of a stamp of honor, a badge of honor on having you know having having led a very successful music career, and so wanting the validation of a, uh, uh, a Western audience, they, they strive as much as possible to, to you know, to get even. I, I'm not even, I, just to get just a Grammy nom nomination, you know. But also, we even see it in the case of the Eddies too. Last year, the Eddies held its first ever 
comes uh, had a festival edition in over 15 years in Atlanta last year. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can yeah. Nigerian award, a Nigerian dedicated an award dedicated to celebration of Nigerian music culture to, to America to 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 foreign land. Why? Well, what was the rationale behind that? So I think there's a there's of course there's a there's an insecurity with us as as a Nigerian, we, we have this it's blatant insecurity. Uh, we feel like uh, we really need to be out there. We need to showcase our music, our stuff to other people before we can, you know, to win their validation. Because before we can feel complete with ourselves, feel uh, successful in our own right. Um, so I, I think it's dealing with that insecurity. Not of course we won't admit to that, but. It's something that is, you know, latent in all of us. You know, the same thing happens to the writers too. You know, writers wanting to appeal to a uh, Western audience, you know, in order to to be termed successful and all that. So, so we look True. to the West basically for validation. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So speaking to your point about um, the insecurities we have as a collective, when was the last time you saw a Davido or Bonaboy attend a Hedy's ceremony? You know, once you cross a particular threshold, what you care about is winning Western Awards, the Grammys, the BETs, the Mobiles. That's what they mostly care about. Once they hit that threshold and they don't care about our local awards. And yet we now complain that those guys are racist if you don't win an award or something. It doesn't make sense, especially a Bonner boy that lectures us about our history. <laughs> you know, you waste no time telling us, oh, we need to learn about our history, our history, our history. You know, it fakes this, <laughs> this patriotism, this Africanism. It fakes yeah. it. But what it matters yeah. the most, he doesn't care about local awards anymore. So you can see the hypocrisy. The, the hypocrisy so, stinks. Self-appointed, self, self, self uh, self-styled Pan-Africanists. Exactly, African bro. Like exactly. It stinks. The hypocrisy stinks. stinks. And I can't stand it, it yeah. honestly. I think I think that's what that's what separates Afrobeats now from Afrobeats. Of course, I even like to call Afrobeats Afropop. You know, but you know, I think Afropop is a, is is a is a is a better fitting name for for it than Afrobeats. But you know, because I don't see the connection between the two of them. You know, I don't see how they are connected. I don't see how um um using music as a medium for channeling grievances at the government, at society, at you know, using music to build up better society. Uh, I don't see how it's connected to using music to express your desires to to talk about, to rave about your sexual fantasies and all that. I don't see how they're connected. Absolutely. So I think that's that. Uh, I mean, that alone is a is a uh, is a is a dichotomy between um, Afrobeats and more Afrobeats. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, what do you think about TikTok? Uh, since the emergence of TikTok. It has mostly been used as a medium to promote songs. You know, TikTok has a lot of uh, features that make people uh, invent certain trends, right? And so, with that trend, you could you could attach a song, and that song could actually go viral. We've seen it in the case of CK's "Love in One City." We've yeah. seen it with Wandeko's uh, "Gentility." When "Gentility" came out, I I didn't it didn't come under my radar at all. But when it blew up on, on TikTok, I had to go listen to it and I actually fell in love with the song. It's one of my favorite songs of last year. Even though that song came out, I think in 2017 or so, it was all thanks to TikTok, it blew up last year. And, you know, um, also Oja Piano blew up on TikTok. You know, I was able to know of Oja Piano all thanks to TikTok. So TikTok is a very weird app in that sense. But what do you think about it though? Well, I think uh, I think we are we are starting to see TikTok as a formidable tool for music uh, distribution and uh, marketing. You know, um, yes, it's um, because quit Twitter because of its rise of uh, micro influencers. You know, TikTok uh, allows um, you to make your own content creation and all that. And we saw this we saw this rise in you use of TikTok up surge. We saw the surge in TikTok content creators, especially during as a result at the height of the pandemic in 2020, when lots of people were cooped up in their homes and bored, bored to hell. So yeah, TikTok offered that um, route to um, life, to sunshine, to you know to the outside world. 
uh, and so if you remember then we had there was, a, there was this semi to do care challenge you know when she was pregnant yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. you know I, I saw how it blew up it went so viral on tiktok yeah tiktok and instagram so i think tiktok uh, at that point tiktok emerged as um, you know uh, as a force to reckon with you know uh, for music distribution and marketing, as I said earlier, because of its uh, thousands of micro bloggers and content creators that could help spread your music. So um, I'm sure um, record labels are starting to, you know, um, develop uh, strategies to promote their music using TikTok. Yeah, um, I think in 2021, Love wanted to see Case One it became the most streamed most Shazam song in two, September of that year, 2021. So, yes, it became the most Shazam song then, and even rose to what, number what on Spotify's uh, this thing. So yeah, I it's it's amazing how TikTok came to be, you know, came to be such a, a useful tool for musicians and especially for up and coming artists. Basically, you know. You go if you could get your song out there, get a couple of these things, use them for your content. You know, it's it's sure to reach a wilder, wilder, uh, wilder user, wilder uh, number, wilder number of years. Yeah, and it also, it also has to do with the statistics, number of people who spend their time, who have TikToks, you know, so number, number of TikTok users. I think so far, I, I can't say, I can't, I can't give you correct statistics for. TikTok users, complete TikTok users, but I knew there was a statistic that was carried out in 2020 and found out that um, users spent at least 58 minutes on TikTok each day. I mean, 58 minutes is surely long, but it's a large number of time for you to, just, you know, to listen to, I mean, uh, it's a large quantity of time to listen to at least five songs. At least five songs. So, yeah, so um, because of its... Um, user friendliness i'm sure um people more and more people are you know coming to embrace the app and it's a good way to also spread your music because you know uh you know there's this thing on social media where one person's own in this culture where if this person listens to this person uses the music then that's really good you know you know so someone the next person uses it for his own for their own content and from there, from there, it spreads, it spreads. Because, so I would like to look at it like, I mean, if you had to, if you wanted to eat a malana, you go to a mala spot and you find lots of people in the spot. And beside you, there's another mala spot with very few people inside. You, of course, you want to go to the one that has lots of people inside because you're, you know, at, at that point, you're assuming that they offer a better mala or sweeter mala than the one with the same. So it just appeals to that part of us that, you know, wants to be follow the crowd the head mentality yeah so also in a sense tiktok uh is a hack against the gatekeeper culture which makes uh it is a good segue to my next question now the emergence of the internet and streaming platforms has led to an explosion of the independent uh independent label industry especially in countries like the u.s the U.S. has a sizable market for indie artists. Some of them are even popular here in Nigeria. An example will be Dax, right? Dax is kind of popular mm -hmm. with Nigerians. And he's an ind independent mm -hmm. guy, you know? You know, the U.S. has that market. But in Nigeria, it's not really a sizable market yet in Nigeria. You know, for, for the most part, for you to make it here in Nigeria as, uh, as an upcoming artist, you need to be mm -hmm. signed by a major record label the Maven Records, the Chuck Boys, I mean, the Chuck City, sorry, uh, YBNL of this world, right? Why do you think that is, um, despite the fact that we are extremely populated as a country, and I can imagine how many artists are still struggling out there to get their music out, you know, but still they need to be signed by record labels. Normally with the development of the internet, with TikTok, for instance, you know, with all these platforms, we are supposed to have a sizable uh, market for indie artists, but for some reason, that is not the case. Why do you think that is? Ah, well, 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 that's, that's quite a tricky question. Um, you, you know, I think, I think I would say our industry hasn't evolved to that level. You know, our industry hasn't evolved to that level. I'll, I'll say that first. 
Um, yeah, as I explained, if you check out earlier, in the early 2000s, we had very few record labels. Uh, one of, uh, at least one most prominent one of them was Kenneth Music. You know, and uh, you can understand how it was being run then. The um, uh, um, sharing formula was, was pretty, pretty... Uh, Awful. Exploitative, yeah. Exploitative, yeah. yeah, that's the word. Exploitative, yeah. So, but now the, the um, advent of the internet, um, uh, we saw more and more record labels springing up. Uh, already, also, we saw artists after their um, contract expires, they don't bother to renew, and then they go ahead to you know establish their own record labels you know, and all of that stuff. And yeah, but um, in Nigeria too, we've also seen some, some, a couple of, a group of indie artists, uh, like a uh, recent guy on the block, over the block. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, this is other, also this, this is other guy too, Obon, uh, Obon Jaya or something, Obon Jaya is his name. He's a Nigerian guy, but uh, he, he, I think he lives in London. He's based in London in the UK. So yeah, he, so he's also an indie artist too. Um, yeah, but uh, but what these people are doing, you know, is that what what's happening is basically that the internet is providing, um, it's giving us more freedom, more liberty, more tools to, uh, experiment to do to carry out things that would typically, um, be done by corporations and experts before in in, in years past. So. Uh, uh, as time goes on, definitely, I know with time, I'll uh, call uh, evolve, obviously. But I think at this level, I don't think um, that the, there is so much for an indie artist. I think eventually the indie artist will still have to come under a record label somehow or come under a partnership some way in order to thrive in Nigeria. Because, yes, we at the point now, we are still far behind and we do not have all the resources to for one individual to adequately make music, produce and distribute and market, you know? So you still need, you still need, a, you still need a, a, the support of a, of a label or something of, an, of a corporation behind you, you understand? So at, at this point level, I think, I, I don't think we, we have evolved to that level yet. For so even the Obonjaya guy I'm talking about, he's based in London, so he can afford to do, uh, do these stuff, you know? Uh, from that side, but for us here, you still need to at least need the backbone. True, true, true. Um, speaking about the proliferation of record labels, yeah, you you said the playbook for most artists now is once their contract expires, they go set up their own record label. I mean, we've seen that over and over and over and over and over. But the way it seems to me is this: those record labels are just a front for just one artist you know they they hardly sign other artists or, or even if they do those artists don't thrive under them we saw this with whiz kids uh, and um his signees terry terry didn't really didn't make it right uh mm -hmm. i think ricardo bank has a record record banks record other than Rick ricardo banks we don't know who else is signed under that record label even potable now has his own record label you know everybody's just having their own record label and it's really just a front for them to to promote themselves and have a hundred percent stake in the the proceeds of of their music, they don't want to share anything with any uh, any boss or anything like that. So it's just it's just interesting, and it's very easy for you to do anything in Nigeria. It's very easy for you to sell a record label. I can imagine it may not be that easy over there in the US. I, I don't know, I don't know, but it's very easy for you to as long as you have that fame, go set up your record label, and that's it. You know, record labels, uh, a record label is supposed to, supposed to serve for you as like a form of apprenticeship, you know, like the Greek apprenticeship before you then become a master. But um, in a bid to establish, you know, to establish yourself, to declare yourself as a master, people just, you know, after the GS thing, don't bother to, you know, to learn again from the master and feel like they can, they have better fits to start up their record labels. And that's why you see that even despite the fact that you have a lot of record labels springing up here and there, very few still succeed, you know, they don't succeed as much, you know, that's because they, they are missing a thing in this, in, in, in the arts, in the business, basically of managing uh, music, managing music and all that. So um, I think that has to do with a bit, uh, impatience on our parts, you know, you need to want to assert yourself too soon, sooner than you think you are capable and you're not willing to pay attention to the and um, 
uh, uh, integrity of uh, running a business and all that. And that's what we've seen with successful record labels like Mavins and um, Mavins and uh, uh, YBNL. YBNL, yeah, exactly. Because I feel like the business of running a record label is more like running an empire, so which requires more more insights, you, you know. Um, in the case of WizKids and this thing, I uh, yeah, I, I I would say probably it's bad at managing a record label. Yeah, because I mean, uh, as a master, you're supposed to have uh, people under your feet, you know, learning at your feet. I would say it's bad at managing a record label. He, he, he just, or he, he, there, there are two things either beside it. He's either bad at managing a record label or he's self-centered, so concerned only about himself, about going to the top and not, uh, 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 um, you know, and not carrying another grooming, um, you know, a successor. So there are two things to explain is the, you know, because so far his record label seems pretty empty. It seems like he's just the, he's just a star boy of the record label, you know, nobody under a shadow. So, to his, to, his I, credit, I, to his credit, the video has given shine to a number of artists on his record label, yeah. to his credit, yeah. you know. Yeah. But for some reason, Whiskey couldn't do that. Even Bonaboy couldn't do that. The only artist assigned was Buju, and Buju did not attain that commercial acclaim on that Bonaboy. So it was when he left Bonaboy, yeah. you know, people began to know Buju and all. Yeah. Well, it's it probably shows their weaknesses, you know. Yeah, that okay, yeah, maybe those people could be, you know, could have this lyrical brilliance. They could be dexterous when it comes to making music, making good sounds that people can dance to. But when it comes to the art of managing a business, they are, you know, they are poor. They are poor at yeah. it. And you know, it's not about the video. A lot of people feel that the video is a better manager than the musician. People feel like, oh, maybe the video wasn't just, maybe just this boy who thought maybe he didn't know what to do with his father's phones and just decided, so who oh, let me just, you know, move into music and all. People feel like the video is not a musician, he just keeps forcing it and all that. That is, is better a, an entrepreneur than, than an artist. Well, um, well, maybe they could be right. They yeah, are, perhaps they are right. Uh, we also saw that in the case of Mr. Rizzi too. You know, we did a copy yeah. of music, I distinct of musician, but uh, you know, it flourishes better as a as as an entrepreneur, you know. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. You know? Yeah. Definitely. So so uh, it, it, it shows their weaknesses. So it means that you could actually be better at singing, you could be better at sounds, producing sounds and all, but you could suck at managing a record label. Uh, which is nothing bad about it anyway. You know, we all have our different um, um, strengths and weaknesses, you know. But I believe when it comes to managing a record label and if you like, okay, your strengths are not like in record managing, you could require, you could now hire professionals to, you know, to run that. I want to get your thoughts on Afrobeats and tourism. Do you think as a country, we've monetized Afrobeats to its full potential, especially from a tourism perspective? No, I don't think we've monetized Afrobeats to its full potential. Actually, no, I don't think we've monetized. I think more, I, 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 and I think uh, what we, what we experiencing, the government is not probably paying enough attention to Afrobeats to uh, broadening the appeal of Afrobeats to um, foreigners to foreign investors. I think it's just a conscious collaborative effort amongst um, art singers and producers to just push the frontiers of Afrobeats beyond Africa to uh, Western audiences. So I don't think we've money. We've actually, we I don't think we've unnessed the potential of Afrobeats yet, you know, because if we do, we would have museums dedicated to educating um, tourists, um, to exploring the, the genesis of Afrobeats, to exploring, um, you know, the cultures and some of all these um, subgenres would have, um, uh, artifacts and stuffs, you know, beauty in honor of Afrobeats and its legendary founders and all of that stuff. So, but the government is obviously, as a typical Nigerian government, they, they have more pressing issues to focus on than on uh, flippant issues as music. Yeah, I did a video like a couple of weeks ago in which I argue that. Um, you know, Nigeria should have like a visa-free policy for Africans 
who want to come and attend shows here in Nigeria. You know, that's one of the ways we could boost the tourism industry. Now, I can only think of how that would contribute to, let's say, the hotel industry, for instance, the aviation industry, for instance. You know, let's make it extremely easy for foreigners to come to the country, you know, have a good time, attend whatever shows they want to attend, you know, and that is going to have a far reaching effect on the economy. The value chain around that, I believe, would be huge. But of late, I've been even thinking that why don't we have like an Afrobeat visa for anyone all across the world who wants to come to Nigeria specifically to attend an Afrobeat concert or an Afrobeat shows? You know, we could actually have that, an Afrobeat visa specifically for Afrobeat. And I'm also thinking about how state governments could also organize concerts, like a seven-day concert, or for instance, um, call all the biggest Afrobeat stars to your state for seven days. You can handle the all the logistics, whatever it is, and allow you know private investors to invest in whatever aspects of that concert they want to invest in. Now, think about the number of Nigerians that will travel all across the country to that state to attend whatever shows they want to attend out of those seven days. It's going to boost the hotel industry. It's going to boost the culinary industry. It's going to boost the aviation sector. But I don't know why we are not the thinking people. Our governments are not thinking. We could, I believe we could monetize Afrobeat to its, to its molecular potential, and that would boost the entire economy. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, of course, absolutely. Those are really great ideas for monetizing Afrobeats, and I do agree with them. I, uh, I, I'm sure yeah, I subscribe to those ideas too. Yes, yeah. The thing about us and uh, our tourist in the, uh, tourism industry is that we still believe in these conventional forms of tourism, like museums and um, statues and artifacts. And yeah, music could also be a form of tourism, but we don't probably realize that. You just feel like, oh, music is just all about entertainment. And that's why the government has not... Um, has not you know sought to really understand explore explore this growing or burgeoning you know burgeoning uh sphere of music called Afrobeat. You know if you look at it, the government doesn't even pay attention to Afrobeat. They don't even see it as something that could welcome foreign investors and all the likes. You know, because I still see music. I do see Afrobeat as you know, in spite of um, Nigeria's um checkered reputation. You know, in of that, that Afrobeat is just uh, Afrobeat is just that one one thing that I could you know that you know we could usually the West would want to romance with Nigerians. So you know, so I told we all know we were known to be fraudulent and um, um, corrupt and all of that. But well, when it comes to Afrobeat, all of the world wants to embrace us. All of the world wants to collaborate with us and all of that. And that's 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 a really very good front. That's a good 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 way by which you could you know attract foreign investors into that. Yeah, when of course you see that. But yeah, being Nigerian government, being who they are, they don't consider this. They don't even go look at it in the direction of Nollywood and see how they can boost the Nollywood sector to you know grow so well and you know send. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the thing is, if you look at the movie industry and the music industry grew in spite of the Nigerian government. I could remember yeah. in, in the early 2000s, Hollywood producers and, and actors, they sought the help of the, of the government to help curb piracy. But the government never really did anything about that. And the piracy industry, you know, um, they... they I was the word was the word I'm looking for the word. They exploited the artistry of of Nollywood producers and actors for years. You know, they would make fake copies of their movies. Even they they made more profit from those guys more than the profits they made themselves. You understand? But the Nigerian government didn't do anything about that. The same thing with music; they didn't do anything to stop piracy. But in spite of all that, they they became successful. Afrobeat is what it is today in spite of what the government didn't do to help them. And so now that we have an opportunity to even, you know, monetize it more, the government is still not doing anything about that. It just tells you it's, the kind of people yeah. we have, man. Tells you. It's it's crazy. In, in, in terms of Nollywood, we had uh, 
So you have cases of, uh, you know, you could be assured that if you made a good, very good film, you could sell it to Netflix or any other streaming platform, Amazon Prime and the rest, and they could buy your, I could make your money from it. But in terms of uh, uh, regards to music, it is much, uh, it's much, the competition is stiffer. You, you really have to work your way from the trenches down to, from obscurity to, to popularity. So TikTok and, and the rest, you could afford to, you know, spread your music uh, without the help of a record label. You could spread your music and reach broader, uh, broader audiences, you know, unlike before, back in the day where you had to really depend on, you know, you had to, you know, you had to sing, you had to, you, you had to comment on that, on that uh, John Don Jazz's uh, Instagram post or Don Jazz's Twitter, just to, you know, just to, to grab his ears or grab his audience. Yeah, true. true. So, yeah, yeah. The internet is actually making, it's, it's making um, um, content create, it's making, it's making, paving the way for independent artists, uh, content creator, creator or be whatever you may. True, true. Yeah, actually yeah. democratizing access for. Yeah, people. even, even Nollywood, even there are Nollywood account, I'm sorry, there are YouTube accounts for, indie movie makers and they have good yeah. good numbers they, they're raking good numbers now you you could have your criticisms about their professionalism about uh about their effects and things like that they, they are they are criticisms for that you know but still they are making good numbers on youtube uh there are so many you know all these nollywood uh nollywood indie indie uh producers on, on youtube now so i think it's just a fascinating thing how the internet has democratized access to to you putting your content out there and possibly getting your audience you know so yeah, yeah interesting what what are your predictions for afrobeat for the next say 10 years do you think afrobeat could still retain this this uh, this popularity or do you think there could be another sound from africa that could displace afrobeat from um from I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Afrobeat, I'm not sure. Afrobeat will still retain this. Um, this charm. I'm really? not sure. Will still retain, yeah. I, yes. I. I. I'm. I, yes. Uh, I'm pretty sure because time. Time. Time does nothing but to destroy patterns, destroy old orders, and set up new ones. You know, and give give chance to new to new orders to thrive. So that's that's basically what time does, you know. So I'm not sure it will remain long, especially when there is no even conscious attempt by government to, you know, to uh, broaden its appeal or uh, see how we can. Uh, and I think a great mistake we're even making in our time is not documenting enough of Afrobeat's journey, um, you know, to you know, for 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 the future for the, for the future generations to explore. Yeah, yeah, I think we're not, yeah, our music is there, you know, but we're not documenting enough about the rich diversity of Afrobeats, you know, for generations to come to explore. And that's a great mistake in our times now, because I do feel that um, as time goes on, the appeal will shift, especially when the new generation, especially for a generation coming after us. Uh, and uh, with rapid technological advancements, you, you can be very sure that we, we never know what to be the new trending sounds by then. But uh, I don't think I think Afrobeat will eventually evolve anyway. It will evolve. Yeah, I'm, I'm but, compelled. Uh, I'm compelled to agree with you. Either Afrobeat evolves, or people just gravitate towards something else. It all yeah, to things. Exactly. And really. Yeah. It's the natural order of things. You don't you don't stay at the top for forever. You know there was yeah. a time reggae was extremely popular across the world, but no one really no one really vibes to reggae <laughs> anymore. Even even even, even dancehall even dancehall that kind of replaced reggae is not really as popular as it was once as it yeah. was once. Yeah. So I don't think Afrobeats has the potential to 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 be long lasting in terms of its appeal and charm. I personally don't um, think so. All right. Um, you wrote a scathing article about Bonaboy on the Disaffected magazine a couple of months ago. By the way, guys, if you want to read amazing articles about Nigerian politics, Nigerian culture, you can visit www.disaffected.ng. And you could also submit your articles for publication. 
So in that article, you wrote a very scathing article about Bonabo. You called out his hypocrisy about a so-called activism, right? Could you could you shed more light on that? And also, <laughs> I know you used to be a fan of Bonabo, but I'm not sure whether you are still a fan of his music. But it's very interesting to see you being objective about Bonabo, despite the fact that you are his fan. But anyway, just uh, shed more light on on. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I used to be a fan of Bonner, but I still am a fan of, of Bonner Boy anyway. I mean, I like his, I like his music. I like his, I like the efforts he puts into dedication. He puts into his craft. Uh, it's impressive. And uh, especially, I also like the team behind him anyway. I like the fact that his mom is managing him really well in sharing that the boy. <laughs> So far, you know, if you if you have to look at, um, I mean, if you have to compare the trio of Bernard Boy, Whiskey, and David Dale, you see Bernard Boy has packs both lyrical content and um, rhythm, you know, which you don't find as much. Whiskey now just cares about sound; he doesn't care about the uh, uh, the lyrics again. So you could just see him come up with sounds. Uh, she says she 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 says 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 she you know, so the, my only problem, my only fuss with Bonobo is that I just wish you would just focus on this crowd, you know, that music. Just focus on the music you're doing and, and stop uh, fronting yourself as some activist that you're not, you know. You, you know, it, but the problem with Bonobo, Bonobo just wants to always, always, every time establish himself away from the, you know, the uh, typical Nigerian artist, you know, and try to try to, you know, liken himself to Fela, which of course that's I I I feel like Fela will be turning in his grave at this at this this wanting comparison. That that's yeah. totally okay. you know so uh, so if we look back we, we look at a song like collateral damage when Fela Boy came and he said in the lyrics, my people serve they fear too much. We fear the things okay. we not see. So now so one would expect typically that naturally that oh as someone who's singing a song I mean I, I, at the peak of the end stars in 2020 when a boy would be at the front front of that that movement but he was nowhere to be found he had to be called out on Twitter and only after days on days only after when he was called that he had to now he donated the billboard to the cause you know the same thing happened during the general elections he was largely silent but yeah of course there were other artists who were largely silent during the election period whiskey was equally silent and. Same as David. Uh, okay, yeah, whiskey was called silent, but nobody bothered with whiskey because everybody has always known. Yeah, right from time, whiskey has always set himself to be this, um, um, uh, this quiet guy. guy. Yeah, quiet guy, indifferent to the politics of Nigerian politics. You know, but Bonaboy has always been trying to establish himself as uh, not sort of a messiah. Um, would I call it? Whatever it was, the philosopher or Pan Africanist philosopher that I supposed to, for if you want to learn about uh, trying to lecture Nigerians about their history, about their rights, and whatever. You understand? If you want, I mean, I feel like the best way to lead is to lead by example. True, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. lead by example, please. Yeah. I don't come up and try to. So that was my reason for saying I feel he's a good musician and I feel like it's just good to just focus on you. Don't try to, you don't try to create yourself. Yourself into a modern day fella that you're not, yeah. I mean, with your with your lavish lifestyle and you know, you know, with that, you know, earlier we talked about the celebrity hero worship culture, but it's very fascinating that you were you're actually objective. I like people to your objective, you should be willing to call out your your team, you should be willing to call out your tribe when they do something wrong, and that has actually been my philosophy about anything, politics, culture, what what have you. You know, have that epistemic objectivity, that epistemic humility to, to, um, to, to speak the truth, you know, always side with the facts. The facts are the facts. They don't care about, you know, your ideology. They don't care about your emotions. Just stick to the facts. And you're able to do that in an article, you know. All right. Um, what are your thoughts about Portable? The the new <laughs> what I thought about the guy. <laughs> <laughs> ah, 
you know, <laughs> that if I, that is one guy. I think I think that's one guy in the Nigerian industry. I don't even focus on. Like I have never. I, I don't think I've ever gone on the internet and said, "Oh, to type portable, or to download any of his track, or to you know to focus to you know to to check out his latest antique." So I I, I really know, but you know, I think people like portable. Are, we like to call them a comic co comic distraction in Nigerian music industry. You know, we probably need some sometimes some uh, some people like him sometimes they are just they're just different. You know, people that just you know they are display their <laughs> their cross so uh, what I call it cross stupidity or something. You know, a long time. Yeah, uh, right. I don't know. Well, yeah, I don't listen to his music. I don't know what he does. I don't know how well he sings. I don't know. What's uh, you know, I know nothing about next. Nothing about that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, uh, I don't know how to explain these. I actually like a couple of his songs, though. Uh, yeah, now, I, I remember what you told me. You liked his uh, his, his album or something. Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, no, for the most part, the guy is goofy. He does his persona, you know, and uh, it, sometimes he's actually funny. And I think Portable is at his funniest when he's unintentional about about what he is saying. Now, I understand that most times he tries to overplay that goofy persona, and I don't find those those memes or videos of you actually funny. But when he's actually unintentional about something and he says his mind, he's actually very funny. You know, that's a kind of, uh, that's, that's how I see the guy, you know, musically speaking, I kind of enjoy a couple of his songs. This, the one he did about, uh, I don't know whether I know the song, Apostle Must Hear This. The, that's this against um, Apostle Suleiman. You know, I'm really? actually, yeah, oh, you, you've, you've I, not heard of, you know, you've not heard a track. I've not heard it. Uh, I actually, I, I want to write something about that. I, I suppose I'll write it one of these days, but. You know, I, I I genuinely like a couple of the songs. That Apostle Must Hear This is um is a commentary about you know how prestige how the kind of lifestyle pastors tend to live in Nigeria. You know, it goes mm -hmm. to the song Fella. One of you know Fella did a number of songs about pastors. You know, living in expensive yeah. neighborhoods yeah. and everything. Yeah, it's pretty much like that. That's that's a kind of that's a thematic preoccupation of that song. So now, as in terms of his personalities, obviously, I don't like I don't like him. You know, personality wise, but musically speaking, I, I'm 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 kind of detaching the arts from the artist here. You know, I kind of vibe to some of the songs, but in terms of his persona, no, he doesn't cut it for me. He doesn't cut it for me at all. <laughs> and it's very ironic that this guy trends on Twitter almost every week. He finds a way of 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 being relevant, and I, I have to give it to the dude, man. This guy has has remained relevant despite predictions that this guy won't last in the industry you know well where is I, the, I personally yeah. predicted that this guy is not gonna last but somehow he finds a way of you know being relevant making it to the news making it on a trend trend list but you have to give it to the guy man well yeah i i, I equally thought it was just the flash in the pan that so far is you know without is is uh disappointed my predictions yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which which artists are you listening to right now? Nigerian artists you're currently listening to? Ah, Nigerian artists. Um, hi. I, I I listen to a couple of them right now. I know I've been listening to Stormzy lately. Yeah, Stormzy. But um, I would say currently I'm listening to Asha and Thames. Oh. Asha and Thames. I'm yeah. judging by my recent playlist. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, okay, so too. in the past year, which Afrobeat EP or album would you say is the best in the past year? Hmm, that's a really tough one. In the past year, Afrobeat or EP has been the best. <sighs> oh, man, it's, it's, it's hard to choose one, you know. It's hard to really choose one. Uh, people would say, people would say Omalays. Omalays. Uh, I, I agree like with that. that. <laughs> I, I actually agree with that, with that sentiment, to be honest. <laughs> people would say Omalays, this thing, because of Bo the emotion. Boylon. Boylon. Boylon, yeah. I, I really cannot put my hand on any of That's the thing. You know, that's the thing. 
I understand. I understand. You know, we we have these uh, choice paralysis now with the invention of streaming platforms and everything. There are so many artists we have on on the roster right now, so it's very difficult for you to keep track of of every single project, every single song. The, these guys drop almost every week. Exactly. So, you know, we are inundated yeah. with, yeah. with with that yeah. choice paralysis. So, anyway, let's let's wrap it up. Uh, where can people find you? I'm available on Twitter. It's um, Charles King. So C H A R L E S K I N S. Also, I have a medium account where I write about pop culture and yeah, typically pop culture and society at large. Uh, uh, medium does com slash arts gramophile. That's gramophile spells G R A W M O P H I L E. So Twitter and Medium are two spaces people can find my works or get connected. All right, I'll be dropping all the links in the description below. Thanks very much for taking the time to talk to me today, despite all the glitches and everything. Yeah, I appreciate it. I say uh, thank you so much for having me. Cheers, yeah. man. Yeah, have a Cheers. good one.